so the fragility aspect actually came up when I was at the bank, after I'd been at the bank for about nine or 10 years. Uh, and it was a very interesting uh, f- f- uh, anecdote, if you like, uh, because this is sort of the, how it really got started at the bank as well. We used to have an annual meeting where we would review the countries that had performed particularly badly. We would review all countries, but we would review, pay a lot of attention to a country that had performed particularly badly in the past year in terms of their economy and poverty reduction and things like that. And it, it struck me that the, it was every year, it was the same countries that were on the list. <laughs> you know, and we would say, oh, we have to do better with Burundi, uh, you know, next year. And then you go next year, Burundi is still on the list. And that's what got me thinking. Uh, and I remember talking to Paul Collier about this because Paul was the director of the research department at the time. Say, you know, there's something going on here that why are these countries the same ones that are on the list? They're, they're actually, they're, there'll be some countries that join the list, but very few leave the list. Uh, and that's when we started thinking that there may be something uh, unique or distinctive about these, uh, about these countries. So this is a great headway to one of the questions I wanted to, to ask you. I mean, there, there's many of them. Um, I would absolutely love to ask you to make the pitch for economics that you would make for the students. Not, not necessarily as a, as a way to understand fragility, but we can talk about this. But tell us a bit about the paper that you wrote in 2011 that was about the escaping the fragility trap. And what is fragility to you? We want to know, you know, I mean, both of you are training as an economist from the experience you, you've gathered. Um, how do you define that term? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'll tell you about the paper because that, that, that actually then gets us to the fragility. Uh, and that, again, you know, was, was as a result of an experience. When th- at that time, I was a chief economist for the sub-Saharan African region. And there, what I noticed was that, you know, we would allocate aid based on research that I and others had done, uh, based on the quality of policies and institutions in countries. And there were a group of countries, which were these fragile states, where the policies and institutions were, were terrible. That's one of the reasons they were fragile states. But as a result, they got very little aid. And that then led to a syndrome where countries would 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 be doing very badly. They get even less aid because they were doing badly. So they would do even worse the next year. And then they would get even less aid. And you would get into this syndrome where, you know, there might be a situation where they were caught in a trap. And I remember, you know, the country that, that where this came home to me was Guinea-Bissau. It's a small country, perennially in, in fragility, uh, and was getting just a piddly little uh, uh, little amount of aid, and they were having you know serious problems, say with electricity. They, 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 you know, they, they needed very little money to rebuild the electricity plant, the one electricity plant in the country, uh, but they didn't have enough money, and so the power kept going out. And of course, that makes it easier for rebels to run around and shoot people. Um, and uh, that just got kept getting worse. So I began to think, and, and the, the, on the positive side, that w- maybe this way of allocating aid had a problem with it. <laughs> Even though, as I said, I contributed to the <laughs> analytical foundation, so I think it was well versed on uh, strong foundations. Uh, but there may be a problem, which is we should be thinking, for these countries, we should be thinking of aid not necessarily as just allocating it where it's most productive, but rather think of it as taking a risk. It's a bit like venture capital. So with Guinea-Bissau, if we can continue to allocate aid the way we normally do, they'll never grow. So why don't we just take a gamble and put a lot of money into Guinea-Bissau? And that still may not work. But if it does work, that will get them out of this trap. And that's the, that's the way in which we, we evolved this idea of the fragility trap, that too many countries were, were, were uh, f- faced with this uh, sy- syndrome of uh, getting, getting caught in a trap. And if you continue business as usual, they were not going to get out of the trap. That's the sense in which it was a trap. 
Now, what that says about fragility is that these are countries, is really how they got into the trap in the first place. Because then you start looking at how, uh, you know, how they ended up in the situation. These are countries where the, the system of governance was so weak that the state had no longer was able to provide basic security to its public. Now, it, it, and that's sort of a fundamental function of the state. But the, the truth is that if, you're, if the state is unable to provide basic security, chances are it's unable to provide a lot of other things, like basic education or health or water or sanitation. And that's why this, the, the, the fragility is really a, a syndrome of a complete breakdown of the institutions that make a, a state function. <laughs>